If you do have a Bible, go ahead, open it up to Philippians chapter 4, as we are turning the page from, obviously, chapter 3 to chapter 4, and this is the last chapter of this book, and so we're going to slow down a little bit, because there's some very significant applicational truths, not that the theological truths don't have application, we're going to put these things together, and Paul says, okay, now because of all that we've gone through, all that we've heard, all that we focused on, on the previous chapters of this letter, now this is how we are primarily to apply these things. And so he goes through telling us a number of things, a number of ways in which we are to apply what we know, because truth unapplied doesn't change us. But when we have truth, we need to have the truth. We need to personalize it, we need to process it, we need to chew on those things, and then we are to live these things out in our reality with the Lord in the world, with our brothers and sisters in Christ, and so we indeed focus on that. So thank you for Team M&M, Michael and Margie, for preaching the last two weeks, so thank you wherever you are. Michael's not here, he's on vacation, but Margie, thank you for that. And we are to be grateful for how the Lord has brought this church together, Uh, three different churches coming together, um, various traditions, various backgrounds, different ages, and the Lord has given us uh, lots of people who are theologically astute to go along with those of us who are continuing to learn and grow and people who are just... um, investigating Christianity. And I'm grateful for our mature saints. We need them. I'm grateful for those who are just walking in the door and just learning and coming to Christ because we all need each other as God continues to do His work in us for His glory. So if you are familiar with Scripture, you'll know from Genesis chapter 1 that we are created in the image of of God, okay? And thinking about what that means, okay? Obviously, we do not have powers and characteristics that God has in perfection, and some of those things He reserves for Himself. However, we are made in His image, which means that God, by the way, always existed in community. Did you ever think about this, right? The Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, eternally existent forever as in a community. Part of us being made in God's image means that we are made also to be in community, in relationship. Scripture permeates this all throughout its pages. And I already mentioned Jesus' teaching about loving the Lord and loving each other. These things are important, our relationship with God and our relationships with other people, in particular people in the family of God, which is the church. And if you think about your life, the you're probably the greatest um, joys or the thrills or the highs, the proud moments in your life have come in context with relationships with other people, right? Even our first steps, if you had a healthy fo- uh, home, that your parents celebrated. Even our birthdays, when we are born, we celebrate these things because we recognize the worth of individuals made in God's glory. We have celebrations and first steps all throughout our life. If you're married, I hope that you remember how it felt to be there next to your spouse and the thrill that you had there. If you think about the highs of your life, often and most often it is because of relationships and celebrations and accomplishments and connections that you have that give us joy and strength. Now, The flip side of that is also true, that my guess is that your deepest hurts, your um, hardest issues, the places where you struggle and hurt the most is also because of relationships. Perhaps if you have been abandoned or betrayed or left out or forgotten or some breach in relationship, be it of a physical family member, a child, a grandchild, a parent, a grandparent, an aunt, an uncle, sports teams, something along those natures, our greatest hurts come from relationships as well. So why are these things true? They're true because, again, we are created in God's 
image and community matters. Relationships matter, both with God and also with each other. And I have people told me, well, I'm good with God, but I really don't like people. Okay? And you say, well, amen, right? Right? Most of those people probably aren't even here, by the way. <laughs> They'd rather be at home. I've heard that, right? Say, well, I love God, but man, it's people that I struggle with. Well, number one, I struggle with people too, okay? We all do. <laughs> Why? Because we're fallen creatures. However, the greatest joys I have are with people as well. And if our theology doesn't translate into our relationships with other people, we have a problem, okay? That we have to live as we live vertically to be like Christ. This has to and must be evidenced in how we relate to other people. And there's other people who say, well, I love people, but I'm not sure about God, okay? God is continuing to work on them as well. Relationships matter, and particularly in the church, because there are pressures and there are problems and there are winds that happen that try to destroy us from the outside in. And then there's internal divisions and there's complaints and they're not getting along and we love Jesus, but I'm not sure if I really like that person sitting over there and I hope they sit over there. When we go to a potluck, I hope they sit at a different people place over there, right? which I hope isn't you, and we do pretty good as a church on this, by the way. We do actually pretty good at this, and I'm grateful for. But Paul then, in this passage today, addresses our relationship with one another. And in this passage, we're going to see three things, and I'm asking you to at least focus on one thing. The prayer always on Sunday morning is that God would give us ears to hear what he is saying to us us, okay? So this message isn't for someone sitting next to you. You're going to like, yeah, this is for you, okay? Have you ever done that? I've done it, okay? (laughs) Oh, this is a good one for so-and-so, right? No, this is a good one for you and me, right? That we need to either be encouraged or we need to be convicted, right? Encouraged that we're doing well or convicted that we need God's help to understand and put these passages into practice. So the prayer is that you would hear, that I would hear what God would speak to us. And I'm asking you to grab just one thing, and perhaps you can grab a couple more, but grab one thing and trust that the Lord is going to be impacting your heart with it. So here we are. Philippians chapter 4, and we're just going to do verse 1, 2, and 3 this morning. And we're going to focus in on three commands, like I was saying. We are to stand firm in the Lord. We are to be of the same mind in the Lord. And there's this little phrase at the end, in the Lord, which is there in this passage. And thirdly, we are to help people work together in the Lord. So these are responsibilities that we have as we look in and at this passage this morning. So here we are, Philippians 1, starting with verse 1. goes this way, Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom Paul is saying, I love and I long for, you, my joy and crowned, here's the command, stand firm in the Lord in this way. Dear friends, okay? So we see our first um, point here, stand firm in the Lord. And if you can just go back to the verse, and if you'll do that all the way through, that way people can look at the verse as we're talking through it. Okay, so again, if you've been with us a couple weeks ago, three weeks ago, four weeks ago, whatever it was, I talked about any time you see this transitional uh, phrase here, therefore, you have to ask the question. It's a little cliche, but it helps. What is it there for? Okay? And so as we look at that, what Paul is pointing to then, saying, hey, everything I've just said, and in particular, the preceding verse, based upon the truth that is in this verse, now I want you to do these things. So if you just go up one, back one verse into chapter 3, you'll see these commands or these truths put here. That we are, number one, citizens in heaven. Number two, that Christ is coming back, and when he does, he will bring everything under his control and also transform our lowly bodies to be 
like his glorious body. So he has told us that, number one, you have to understand that your central connection is to the body of Christ as a citizen of the Lord. This will last eternally. And your number one identifying factor is that you are a child of God, that you are a citizen of heaven. That government will come down. Before that happens, we have all of these suspect and corrupt in various ways, governments and systems, but someday it's all going to be set right. He will come back. This is a guaranteed promise that is over and over and over in Scripture. And we believe it by faith based upon the character of the one who gave the promise. And if you're going to believe anyone, believe Jesus, okay? When he says things, he's always, of course, backed them up, how he lived, what he said he did, and what he promises to do, he will do. So we are citizens of heaven. The Lord is coming back. And by the way, good news is we're going to get new bodies. Yay! And everyone's excited about that. Right? Now we, of course, and this is besides the point, we'll recognize each other, but he's going to make all things new. And we can say amen to that. That helps us, okay? So everything's going to be put right. So we know that internally as Christians that this is a promise, okay? That our society will be made right. We'll have a one true king. We'll have new bodies. We'll be a part of this group. So this is what we look forward to. And this truth, I hope, is central to your thinking. Now the question is, we're not there yet. So how then are we to live until that point? Paul says, therefore... Because of these things now, this is how we are to interact with one another. And first off, we are to stand firm in the Lord. He says in this way, and he's going to tell us what the ways are. But you have to think about standing firm in the Lord. Now, when you think of that phrase, I hope you think of the last little story that Jesus told in Matthew chapter 7 on the Sermon on the Mount, right? He gave all of these teachings. He gave all of these words, chapter 5, chapter 6, chapter 7. Right at the end of that, he talks about now the person who hears this word and puts them into practice is like a person who builds their life upon a rock. Remember that? Right? Standing firm. If you hear the word and, here's, here's a very important point, puts it into practice. Right? Not just about being in church and hearing the word. It's important, but if you don't apply it, it's pointless and useless. Okay? If you hear the word and you put it into practice, you will be standing firm firm upon a rock. So Jesus and his teaching is what we are to stand upon. That's why we speak from the Bible. That's why I tell you over and over and over and over again, read the word and let the word read you. This will anchor you when the storms of life come and they come. Trees literally fall over and roofs leak and things happen that are difficult from cancers to car wrecks to stubbing your toe and the little things, bed bugs, gross. We've, anyway, that's a different story. <laughs> things happen, right? And if you're not grounded on Christ and his words, Man, your life is going to crumble, right? If you build your life upon something, other climbing a ladder of saying, well, I'm going to build it upon being popular or having money or being comfortable or blah, 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 blah. Pick your poison. There's plenty, right? If you build your life upon something other than Christ and his word, the storms of life are going to knock you down, friend. Storms happen to everyone, and so Paul is reminding us, hey, 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 stand firm in the Lord. And there's another place when I read this that reminded me of another place in which we are instructed to stand firm. And this is stand firm against the enemy, 
okay? This is what we find in Ephesians chapter 6, where we're talking about putting on the whole armor of God. That is, setting your mind, having, being protected in righteousness, be walking in truth, be a person of peace, and so on and so forth. And it says, now stand firm, right? Which tells me that there are um, people pushing against us. Now, I did play football when I was just in high school, right? And boy, you have the offensive line, you have the defensive line, and know what the number one thing that they were concerned about? Their cleats, right? Because they're getting up, they're smacking each other, and if they don't have good grip, they're not standing firm, they're going back either one way or the other. You and I are getting pushed against by the enemy. He is coming to destroy your faith so that he can destroy you, right? They go hand in hand. So it says, hey, you have to have your good footing, that you have to recognize that there's storms that come and there's enemies that will push against us. And if your feet aren't on something solid, if your feet aren't ready in position to stand, you're going to be bowled over and knocked down. So standing firm is an important thing. And also, by the way, there are places in Scripture talks about slippery ground, right? Places where you take a step and it's a downward trajectory. Now, I have seen this as a pastor in lives of people that I've known for about 30 years or so, right? They'll start usually pretty good. And by the way, this is how it happens. A downward slide, guess what happens? It happens one step at a time, right? Now, you know how this works, right? You just get away a little bit from, you know, reading the Word, right? Ah, I know it. Ah, it's, it's, it's so hard to understand. Oh, you know, I don't have time, which are all flimsy excuses, right? But you know how we self-justify. So busy, you get away from the Word a little bit, and he's like, yeah, you know, I go to church on Sunday. It's all good, right? Right? And you just walk away a little bit. You go downhill, right? And then say, hey, you know, I'm not going to be, you know, part, you know, church is cool, but man, those people are weird, right? Or it's a long way, or hey, you know what? The gravitational pull of your pillow is really strong on Sunday mornings, right? It just astounds me that people can get up, you know, at 6 o'clock in the morning all during the week to go to church or go to school, but boy, 10 o'clock service that early, what? It just, I don't, I don't understand this, but there's a spiritual battle going there as well. <laughs> but if you get away from being with the body of Christ, you get away from the Word, you know, hey, I can listen to this, I can watch that, I can do that, you know, it's okay. It just happens by degree. People don't jump away from Christ, they just slip away, right? Down and away. And so you have to ask yourself if what you're participating in, (laughs) is it slippery, right? Well, it's no big deal, and to one degree it isn't a very big deal. But on another degree, hey, if you keep going down that path, where are you going to be five months from now, five years from now, five decades from now? It happens by degrees, just a little, just a little, just a little, just a little. And people who are, quote-unquote, on fire for the Lord now are lukewarm, right? Just like everyone around them. How did that happen? Just a little compromise here, a little there, a little slide here, and off we go. So we know the end, what's going to happen. But the question is now, what happens? Are you sliding away or are you standing firm? These are questions that you and I have to answer for ourselves. I can't go into your life. I can't dig into your heart. But the Holy Spirit can. The Word of God can do surgery. And He wants us and helps us and pleads with us to stand firm in the Lord. This is where you will be safest. This is where you make the biggest impact and difference. I plead with you, stand 
firm in the Lord. And Paul is telling this to these brothers and sisters, and I love what he says. Like, these are his friends, right? You are my friends. He says, hey, I love you, and I long for you, just like you would buy, be for your closest friend or, or family member. Hey, I love you. I long for you. You are both my joy and my crown. He's saying that because of how you're doing, this is a, an accomplishment that I am thankful for and proud of, so to speak. Stand firm in the Lord, dear friends. If I could tell you anything, know Christ. Read his word. Understand what he's saying. The Holy Spirit will help you. God gives us teachers and people to help us. And then stand in what you believe because there are winds that will blow that will try to knock you Away, And there are forces that are going to try to bowl you over. And I'm not talking um, um, physical forces. I'm talking spiritual philosophies and thoughts and, and issues that come and attack our mind and try to rob our spirits of the truth and joy of peace and of Christ. We have to be aware and choose. Stand firm in the Lord. I cannot stand firm for you. This is something you have to do. Right? You and I have to choose to do this. So I don't know what your daily habits are. I don't know what you're doing during the week. But question, is this something solid of Christ that is right and good that will help you? Or is it something other which is going to be slippery? Right? You can't Build your life on banana peels. You can put that in your quote book. I don't know where that came from. You'll slip around. Right? Now just hear me, right? This is important stuff. You have a responsibility. I have a responsibility. We have a responsibility as individuals and collectively coming together to help each other and to stand firm in the Lord. Okay? Now, second point. We're going to verse 2. <clears throat> Now, Paul calls, calls out a couple people by name, right? It's kind of shocking to me that he does this, right? He doesn't say, hey, I know there's an issue, please fix it, right? Here's Paul in prison about 800 miles away from Philippi, the city, and he knows about this conflict between two ladies who are fellow co-workers, who are brothers and sisters, who, um, um, what's the word, contend for the gospel, right, whose names are written in the book of life. These are solid Christians who are working at a local church that aren't getting along with each other. And then he addresses this and calls them out by name. Check this out, verse 2. I plead with, uh, uh, yo, I know this word, I've been practicing it all week and I'm going to get it right. Yodia and Syneche, that's how it's pronounced. I plead with, I plead with where was I? I plead with Yodia and I plead with Syneche. To be of the same mind in the Lord. So this is the second place we are to focus. Be of the same mind in the Lord. I plead with Yodia. Plead with Syntyche, right? Pleading with them. Asking them. Saying, hey, you need to be of the same mind in the Lord. Now, he doesn't name what the issue was. We're not sure what it is. And I think it was intentionally left vague because the Philippians definitely knew what it is. But this issue and issues between people in the church happens often where we can get either bent out of shape over something minor and people have left churches because of the carpet color. The carpet color? Yeah. Or there can be more significant issues, theologically deep issues, or issues of how church is done, or what is happening, and, and what is happening, like, hey, this should be this way, no, it should be this way, and people get into disagreements. And so Paul is saying, hey, listen, in the church, you have a responsibility to be of the same mind. 
Now again, these aren't carnal Christians. People are, who are pretending to be Christians who are there just because whatever, they want to get something from the church. These are tried and true believers who love Jesus, who've been giving a life for the gospel, and for whatever reason, they're not getting along. And this does indeed happen in churches. And so Paul's, um, what's the word, Paul's command to them is to be of the same mind in the Lord, okay? So what is he saying here? Be of the same mind in the Lord. Now, being of the same mind in the Lord is not, hey, just work it through and agree with each other, right? He's not saying that. He didn't say be of the same mind with each other. There are some things that you're not going to agree with other people about, right? Should I mention one? Politics. A standing ovation in the front row. <laughs> These things divide churches, right? He doesn't say, hey, make sure you agree on everything. We're not going to agree on everything. That's okay. Right? There's things that we need to agree on central to scripture, who Christ is, some doctrines. We need to agree to be in unity, right? We need to emphasize the places in which we agree. And if you don't agree on something, be in fellowship with each other still. What? They voted for so-and-so. Right. Telling you, elections have blown up churches, the saying, right? Decisions have blown up churches. Now, I'm not saying, okay, um, there are legitimate le reasons to leave a church, okay? For instance, if they're not preaching the Bible, goodbye, right? <laughs> if there's some type of organizational sin that's not being addressed, okay? You try to work it through, right? You try to address it one to another. So there are re reasons to depart. But there's a lot of reasons not to depart, Right? And I think we're too quick to say, you know what, I'm going to go down to that other church down the road, right? Because I, I don't like whatever. It's too dark in that church. <laughs> <laughs> or the pastor's a little weird. And I call it the steeplechase, right? Right? You know what I'm talking. There's a difference there, right? Where it's like, hey, you know, and granted focuses change of churches and giftedness. Okay, I'm, I'm not trying to diss people for things that are legitimate, but we have to make sure that we first pursue connectiveness and we first pursue being together. And so going back to this, be of the same mind in the Lord does not mean that you're going to agree on everything. But what does this mean? Well, let's see. Is there some place in the book of Philippians where Paul talked about the mind of Christ Jesus. This should ring a bell to you. Philippians chapter 2, right? Have the same mind of Christ Jesus who did not consider equality with God something to be hanged onto or grasped and made himself a servant becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. You remember this, right? This is the mindset that we are to have when we have disagreements in particular with fellow brothers and sisters in the church. It's not who's right or who's wrong. The first um, command, in, and really the only command, by the way, for this is to have the mind of Christ Jesus. You have to check yourself before you wreck yourself. Do you like that, right? Check yourself. Do you have the mind of Christ Jesus? When I'm typically in disagreement with somebody, I want to power up, right? Oh, yeah? Well, I know a lot more than they do. Oh, yeah? <clears throat> I'm the pastor, right? It's not right. I'm just telling you. That's why humility is such a um, massively important component to our character. Because if you have the mind of Christ... You'll think, wait a second, I'm not going to hang on to my position or my power. How can I serve this other person or serve God or serve this church? That's a whole different mind frame. Right? God, what is it that I need to become obedient to? 
often we're more concerned about our point than we are about the truth. Think about that, okay? I want to make my point versus what's the truth, right? And what's the truth about myself, right? And notice Paul says to each of these women, he says, I plead with you, Yodia, and I plead with you, Syntyche, I plead with you, be of one mind in the Lord. I think 95% of our conflicts, and again, we don't have a ton in here, right? 95 of them, percent of them could be handled if we just powered down, right? have the mind of Christ. God, help me to be humble. Help me to understand. Help me to be a servant like Christ. Help me to be obedient to your word. And then approach each other in that way. My guess is you're going to work out whatever it is, right? Yeah, it's okay, right? It's important for us to do this. And by the way, Paul names these ladies, right? How would you like to be called out in Scripture for all time, right? Right? Like, really? No one's going to name their granddaughter after me, right? Do you know of anyone named Yodia and Sinaki? You don't. No one wants to name their kid like that, right? Well, why did he do that? I've I've asked myself that question, (laughs) right? Because we have responsibility, personal responsibility for our behavior. He calls them out. When people come to me, and they've come to me on occasion, right, saying, well, you know, there's some people who are complaining about this thing. I can't address some people. Who? Right? Well, it's Gretchen. Okay, then we can talk. <laughs> she goes, amen. <laughs> we need names. Why? Because that's the only way we can healthily connect. I can't have a relationship with an issue, but I can have a relationship with a person. Right? These are people we're talking about. This is why online is great in one way for our social media goes, because it helps us keep connected to people, in particular people we're not physically in the same spot with. But it's also awful, because we now um, separate the point from the person, and we become very vicious online, because we don't think that there's an actual person on the other side, and we just vilify them or demonize them or characterize them, make them a caricature, caricature, that's a hard word to say. You make them into something that they're not. Remember that there are people. There are people in the pews that God loves. God doesn't love you more than the person next to you or across the room for you (laughs) or the different color than you. You understand what I'm saying here, right? Loves us all the same. And churches suffer when people just are at each other. And it's hurtful and it's sorrowful. Knowing that we're going to be together in heaven. And verse 3 talks about, hey, whose names are written in the book of life. But we have personal responsibility to be of the same mind in the Lord. So I want you to think about that, right? And again, I'm not asking you to, well, you have to agree on everything, because uh, granted, you're not. However, we have a command to be of the same mind of Christ Jesus, to be of the same mind in the Lord. I want you to think about the conflicts that you may be having currently or perhaps ones in the past. Think about your mindset there. Say, God, help me. Christ himself said in Matthew chapter 12, every kingdom, every church (laughs) divided against itself is or will be laid waste. And no city or house divided against itself will stand. What unifies us is greater than anything that can divide us. Okay, you hear me now why we're putting communion at the end right the lord being primarily we're one faith one body one spirit right one father one hope one faith one future right that's what can bring us together right 
Not where we live, not our education, not our income, not our ethnicity, not our language. What brings us together is Christ. And when we are together in Christ, it's good and it's pleasant. And when we are together in Christ, according to John chapter 17, right, Jesus' prayer, that the world sees what is happening within walls. And they say, how can this be? And we point to Christ. We point to the cross, right? That's why. But if people come into churches and people are bickering and complaining and they're sitting down, I don't like this person, I don't like that person, or why did they choose that color, and why do you preach so long, right? (laughs) (laughs) Mike, that was hilarious. I'm calling him out. That was Mike. Yeah! (laughs) which I get. Sometimes I do preach too long. But I have more sermons where this came from, buddy. I'll tell you what. For that, I'm going to put you right here in front and center, man. I see you. I know it's dark. I see you. But, but you understand what I'm saying, right? I've had people that said they go to church business meetings, new, new believers in particular, they go and there's this, this you know, visceral and people are like attacking each other. Okay, I'm glad that people are, are, what's the word, passionate about things in the church. However, if we're more passionate about our issue than we are about the other person, we have a problem. And they go to these meetings and like, I'm never going to that church again, nor am I ever going to church again. That breaks my heart because the church loses, that person loses, and Christ it's a bad rap. Granted, I'm not saying we should drop all our issues. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is, God, help us to have the mind of Christ, and we have personal responsibility to look at ourselves and to say, okay, where am I at? What's happening? I need to take responsibility. People must, we must take responsibility for ourselves. I'm going to go to the next verse. This is the last point. Verse 3, Philippians 4, right? So we understood. Therefore, okay, stand firm in the Lord. Be the same mind in the Lord. In particular, people who are fighting within the church, naming names, which include us, we have to think about. And then he goes on to verse 3. Yes, and I ask you, my true companion, we're going to come back to that, Help these women, okay? So there's our instruction. Help these women since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel. Again, I've talked about these are people who are committed to Christ. Along with Clement, who was in the church, the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the book of life. Okay, so here's the command. Help people to work together in the Lord. Okay, Help people to work together together. In the Lord. And if you can go back to the, the, uh, the scripture, that would be awesome. Okay? And so he calls out my true companion. So the question is who is this person? Is it a singular person or is it the whole church? Okay? Because it's a, a singular form of, a, of the noun here. Okay? So is it one person who has responsibility to help or is it the church? My guess is, and I think it's the right guess, I could be wrong, it's the whole church. Why? Because this letter was written to the whole church, not to a person like First Timothy or, or Titus or um, uh, these books. They're, they're written to the church. So what this tells us is then we as a church have a responsibility if we know that people aren't getting along to help them in the Lord to come together, Okay. That's huge. When disagreements become greaterly, greaterly problematic is when we start getting our posse together, our gang together. Can you believe Dave continually talks for a long, long time, right? <laughs> yeah, he surely does talk a lot, right? I'm just using you because you're sitting here. I'm sorry. And then you go over here and it says, yeah, he does talk a lot and blah, blah, blah. So this whole group is like, yeah, he talks too much. And then you got people over here and say, you know, they're disagreeing with Alfred here. Hi, Alfred. Welcome to the front row. I know you hate it now. 
he says, no, he doesn't. He needs to talk longer. And then he talks to this guy. These are my friends on this side. Just kidding. Um, and then, you know what I'm saying? And then he talks to these five people. So then you got like, you know, 20 people and 20 people all taking sides, right? And so now they try to they grandstand, they make issues, and they build walls instead of building bridges. Hello, right? That happens, right? Oh, yeah, you hear about, I can't believe that. Oh, yeah, no, no. wait a second, stop. Did anyone actually talk to the other person, by the way, who is a citizen of heaven? <laughs> who is a brother and sister who is part of the church? Have you considered them? Have you talked to them? Have you sat down, right? And so sometimes we think we help by taking sides. If you're going to take a side, take, be on the side of truth, right? Which is hard to do, I'm just telling you, right? Because you want to empathize. Oh, I can't believe they did that to you. You see them in the parking lot, they just right, right in that spot, and I was coming in, or whatever it is, right? That's a, it's a minor thing, but there's major things. We build sides. And so our response is, if you hear of someone having an issue with somebody else, hey, let's go talk together. Seriously. What? Yeah. Hey, that person, Jesus loves them as well. You know what? Being unified is important. This is how we can help one another. If you know that there's disagreements happening and you're starting to build walls versus build bridges, the issue has now become bigger than just those two. It's become part of us. So we together as a congregation, right? If you say, this is where I go to church, this is where I'm a part of, we are part of a body. The church is who we are, not a place where we meet together. Do you hear that? This is just a building. I'm glad for the building. We have to keep the rain off our heads. We have to do this stuff. But the church is here, right? It's us, we had zero pews and, you know, the building, I don't know, whatever, collapsed because of the roof. We could still, we're still the church. Right? We can meet underneath a tree, right? It's okay. So we have a responsibility, you know, hear me, to help each other, right? Help these people. Right? Help them to be of the mind of Christ. Why? Because the cause of the gospel will be thwarted, stopped, hindered, delayed. Churches who are continually fighting with each other, they're not focused on the gospel, they're focused on survival. Right? And churches get very inward focused, and it's all about them. The deal is, and I've told us this a lot the gospel's for you, but it's not about you. It's about Christ. It's about the world. It's about what he's doing. And so if the devil, okay, through our own sinfulness, we take the bait, gets us so inward focused that we're just concerned about all of the things in here and we're not concerned about the things of Christ, everybody loses. So it's important for us to keep short accounts. It's a it's important for us to say, I'm sorry. It's important for us to take responsibility. It's important for us to help each other of the mind of Christ and to get along. One day we will no longer have our sinful flesh. Right? That's the good news. <laughs> the bad news is we have our sinful flesh. We need the Holy Spirit. We need the solid foundation of the Lord Jesus Christ. We need His Spirit being humble with us. We need to have His mind and help each other in unity because how good and how pleasant it is when brothers and sisters dwell together in unity. That's Psalm 133, by the way. So I want to thank you for all the ways in which you have done this well, right? Three churches coming together, it's hard, 
right? Guess what? We're still here, right? We're, we're better and I think stronger than ever, right? Praise God for that. You know why this happened? Because you said yes to the Lord's leading, right? This community needs places in which people are um, connected together on things that matter most. Christ matters most. His kingdom matters most. His word matters most. Love for him matters most. And love for each other matters most. So my prayer is that you would be in Christ, be in his spirit, right? 